Good evening, viewers. I welcome you all along with my colleague from Delhi University, Professor R. Pirana, to this second session of our discussion. We were discussing in the first session state in medieval India and we had discussed that uh, about the nature of the Delhi Sultanate. And in this uh, present session, we are going to discuss the nature of state under the Mughals how what was the nature and structure and how the state evolved the if uh, 1526 is the landmark when uh, uh, in the battle of panipat ibrahim lodi was defeated by babar and babar laid the foundation of Muslim, uh, of uh, mughal rule in india uh, if we uh, take the very word mughal mughal is a uh, corruption or corrupt of uh, Mongols. So uh, 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 the Mughals were coming from Central Asia. So the foremost and the most important issue is that uh, whether uh, the Mong Mughals had the <coughs> influence of both the Turks and the Mongol traditions or not. If we take the ancestry of Babar, then Babar himself was related with the Turk or the Amir Tamur, ancestors of Amir Tamur uh, from his father's side and from the great Khanate tradition, the Mongol tradition from his mother's side. So he was uh, having the blood of both the Turkish and the Mongol tradition in his veins. So, uh, uh, Baba, uh, even Akbar always um, was uh, boasting about his Central Asian and Mongolite descent. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, here if we uh, trace the um, whether the Mughal state was borrowing uh, the Turkish, Islam, uh, Turkish Islamic Persian or the Mongolite tradition. Uh, before uh, uh, discuss going to uh, in uh, uh, before we are going to discuss in greater de details how the Mughal rulers have acted, let us uh, in brief let me give you a brief that what actually the Mongol tradition or the Turkish traditions were. What were the major features of the the Mongol tradition? Uh, uh, First and the foremost uh, important feature uh, uh, of the Mongol tradition was that the, the chief or the head of the Mongols were the great Khan. Like their counterpart in the Islamic uh, uh, Islamic uh, Islamic aid, the caliph was the, the, the chief of the entire Islamic uh, communities, but uh, unlike the caliph, who was a religious as well as the temporal or the political head of the all the Islamic uh, state. Here the Mongol Khan, the great Khan was not the religious uh, head of the, the Mongols. He was a politically, uh, po uh, he was the political and warrior head. He was, uh, he had no, even in his, he was an elected uh, chief of the Mongol Khanate. The Kurultai or the assembly of the Khans, uh, uh, they were, they uh, used to elect and they used to sign and accept the suzerainty of the great Khan and uh, signature of the Kurultai where the, all the Khans used, uh, were the members of that uh, assembly or Kurultai that was being known. They accept, used to accept by signing, uh, accepting the great Khan as the suzerainty. But so he, uh, in the entire process of election, religion was not uh, uh, in, 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 in any way, religion was not the important factor or the factor at all. Uh, so uh, that way it, it was Mongol Khanate's position was different from the Caliph in the Islamic aid. This, uh, 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 and uh, the Empire was divided among the princes. These princes or Khans used to accept the suzerainty of the great Khan, but in their own territory they were the autonomous rulers. The second important feature was this partitioning of, uh, of the, the state. 
the as uh, i just mentioned that this entire empire was partitioned among the princes and they were the autonomous rulers uh, of their in their territory and accepting the nominal suzerainty of the great khan the third important feature of the mongol uh, mongol tradition was uh, that the heavy reliance on the yasa of chengiz khan yasa or tura also it is known this was the uh, courts or uh, courts on governance which was constructed or uh, may uh, or he it is the chengiz khan who has laid down these courts or tura or yasa so uh, as far as uh, babar and akbar uh, all are concerned they were following they were boasting about their their tradition even we get the reference of tura in uh, tuzuk e jahangiri but uh, from shah jahan's reign on Onwards, uh, and uh, this impact of uh, Tura gradually started fading away, and with the Aurangzeb's revivalism, religious uh, during that phase, you will find that impact of Mongol tradition was uh, receding or almost receded. So this was the these were the main features as far as uh, the Turkish uh, the Mongol tradition was concerned. Now coming to the The, to the turkish what was the base were the basic features of the turkish tradition the foremost or uh, the most important is the they the concept amir temur uh, believed in the concept of the absolute sovereignty he he uh, argued or he mentions uh, he 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 said that since when there is one god uh, then its vice regent uh, vice regent of god on earth should also be one only so he had the b concept of uh, uh, the absolute sovereignty so here we can contrast that how the mongols believed in the partitioning of the empire though it is still uh, we can debate it uh, in detail but just uh, I, since i wanted to give you just the uh, salient features Uh, that's why i had given uh, only the major features so here uh, timurid polity was uh, uh, based on the absolute uh, uh, gives the absolute part uh, to the sovereign uh do historians argue that amir temur himself have never uh, accepted the um, uh, title beyond the amir uh, and it's uh, only his successor shahrukh assumed the par uh, assumed the title of padshah uh, but uh, uh, historians argue that it was the political need because uh, temur himself never belonged to the uh, clan of uh, the changi Uh, of uh, timurid clan so he had uh, 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 he was not uh, part of the mongolid chengiz khan uh, tribe he belonged to a, a distinct tribe and assuming the status of khan might have uh, led to the rebellion of the entire kurultai or uh, other khanid so um, fearing that he had never ex never assumed the title of padshah and uh, he uh, but he never paid uh, much uh, heed or much uh, importance to neither to the kurultai and even after the death of the uh, uh, khan great khan mahmud sorry mahmud in 1402 he has even not bothered to appoint any khan so the point that here i want to which i would like to emphasize that timurid polity emphasized uh, uh, emphasizes upon the absolute nature uh, if we look at what babar how babar was uh, which tradition babar was following Uh, babar uh, babar has uh, never assumed the title of the khakan uh, but uh, he assumed the title of padshah and when the two uh, when after husain mirza's death uh, in central asia when uh, his two sons uh, succeeded uh, or as uh, shared the sovereignty then he uh, expressed uh, 
uh, his uh, uh, that uh, how come a partnership is uh, in a rule is uh, unheard of so he uh, this uh, all this uh, shows that uh, he uh, was uh, uh, he, his, he he was uh, emphasizing upon the uh, absolute nature of the sovereignty uh, however if we see the, the that the concept of timurid polity or whether they were following the timurid tradition or mongol tradition it was uh, 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 put at test immediately after uh, Huma, uh, after Baba's death when Humayu partitioned his uh, father's empire among his brothers and utterly failed in that uh, uh, so Mongol tradition uh, uh, was not successful for a short while you will find that uh, uh, when Akbar ascended the throne immediately before that Kamran's daughter after immediately after the battle of Uttergram when this experiment again was very short lived uh, experiment uh, when Akbar as well as uh, Akbar, uh, Kamran's daughter both were being uh, uh, declared as monarchs uh, but it was again a very short lived otherwise barring these two examples we do not find that uh, this uh, the Mughals uh, as emphasis was on the absolute monarchy so this way they were more tilted towards the Timurid polity we will be discussing in little more detail how the historians have articulated uh, on this uh, this concept of uh, uh, whether uh, the polity was more uh, Mughal polity was more tilted in favor of uh, uh, the Mongol tradition or it was in in the towards the Timurid uh, tradition uh, Professor Rana could you uh, elaborate on the contemporary historians viewpoint that how they have viewed whether the Mong Mughal polity was Turko Mongol in nature or Turk or whether it was Mongol in nature. Uh, Professor Rana, please. Okay, thank you. I think uh, this issue was first, you know, discussed by R. P. Tripathi, the great uh, historian, in his book, Some Aspects of Muslim Administration. There, in fact, uh, he said that uh, it is the Mongol tradition which was basically dominant in the Mughal Empire, you know. Now, the, he says that and he was comparing the Mughal state with the state of the Afghans which preceded them. He says that uh, the fragmentation of power was inherent in the Afghan polity because of, of the very nature of, you know, this, uh, the tribal um, system, you know, this, uh, the nature of, you know, appenizing, you know, the state itself, you know, among uh, members of the, cognate members of the uh, family, you know. Now, on this basis, he says, and that uh, the Mughal um, also followed it and therefore uh, he says that uh, since this was inherently a source of you know uh, it was inherently basically um, a system which discouraged centralization you know because as relations of uh, the Mughal royalty and the nobility were governed by Yasai Trangeji as you said yes, or Tura you know Trangeji now the question here comes you know whether these the relations between the Mughal emperors and their nobility were, were governed by this, you know, Changeji system, these codes, or some other codes, you know, which tradition, you know, I think here again, and if they are sharing the, the, the Changeji system, then naturally the sovereignty had to be shared among lineage members, you know. But if we go historically, I think it is only during the, and this question was in fact, uh, later on this theory was, uh, uh, refuted by Professor Iqdar Alam Khan in his uh, interesting essay on this and he said that uh, I think um, Taku Mangosh theory of kingship kingship you know that, 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 that is the title that, that means he is basically saying that it was both you know that you know now as we have uh, already uh, stated it seems that in times of you know trouble when the, uh, the, the, the emperors were facing you know problem you know I think they were more you know um, lean towards, you know, this uh, course of Changez, you know, and shared power with them. Not only the, as you were saying earlier that, you know, it has been happening earlier, you know, but this tendency 
Uh, it was there during the first phase of foreign in this uh, Akbar also when he allowed his you know that first brother to continue ruling Kabul. You know this he was sharing that power. You know, but then. Later on, Mirza Hakim. Mirza Hakim. Later on, uh, but the ex political experience showed that when Mirza Hakim political. rebelled, no, no, not only political um, um, experience, but the uh, evolution of the Mughal nobility, you know, under Akbar, you know, was taking a different shape and moving in different, you know, directions, etc. Because of that, it was not possible to share sovereignty with these members, you know. Mughals, in fact, you know, later on they started, you know, treating these people, you know, as their now servants. Not as e even uh, the um, experiment got failed. Whether Humayu, it was failed. And uh, if we see that uh, Babar has given this uh, for one day water carrier to the Bhishti, the, uh, uh, hum, uh, he has uh, Humayu. So that means uh, he, uh, they considered that it as a personal property, sovereignty as a personal property, and they they were not basically believing in party. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that that appears. Now, uh, way back in one interesting essay, one you know scholar who has been forgotten now, you know Francis William Buckler, he wrote one essay called Oriental Despot, Oriental Despot, where he propounded the theory of this you know corporate kingship, you know, in relation to the Mughals, you know, where nobles were treated as members and not as servants, you know, he they, there you know that you know. Now, uh, following from that, you will find. That this is from um, Buckler's, you know, this uh, essay. You will find the uh, development of this theme, you know, by using a Weberian category, you know, by Stephen Blake, you know, in an essay called you know, in his book, you know, Shah Jahanabad, you know, where he says that the state. He also says that the 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 state, in fact, you know, assimilated the, in fact, you know, was assimilated within the household, you know. It was part of the state. Was it, it was assimilated within the you know household, and then you find that is why he was able to say that the the, the entire kingdom, in fact, you know, Shahjahanabad was a miniature you know in kingdom. You know, it was a miniature kingdom. You know, now the development of this type of you know works in, 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 uh, clearly shows that there was some kind of you know very intimate relationship uh, between the king Padsha and his nobles. But not as members of the family, you know. I think you know that. So, uh, but there is, uh, uh, there was not much distance also. No, the, the distance. Could, could we see then? Uh, you are arguing that uh, uh, the Weberian concept, taking the Weberian concept, um, uh, he Blake is arguing about that it was a household and patron-client relationship that he is speaking about. So uh, and the whole the concept of the Bandagani Darga that is being developed under. Uh, um, so you will not take the concept of Bandagani Darga as the. Um, Bandagani of uh, Darga here means uh, you are just calling the Darga as Darga. No, you know? Bandagani Darga. Darga the student, uh, the, sorry, the nobles uh, were uh, addressed as Bandagani Darga, servants of the uh, king. Crown. Huh? Yes, crown. No, but there are um, other uh, words also used for certain persons, you know, uh, which shows that they are not Bandagani Darga um, again. For example, you know, like uh, um, Akbar Khan, you know, Mansi. As his farzand, and he called you know this uh, um, the um, Bayam Khan as Baba. In fact, uh, Orange or himself called you know Mirza Raja Jaising as Baba, you know Baba. Baba. And then there was a system of this you know this um, kokas, you know these, all these kokas within the family, you know kokal das that term, and also the system of this you know anagas etc. You know foster mothers etc. So there was a household at one place, but this household was not totally. The entire state, you know. Could, could, could we then uh, hear a little bit if I can el elaborate on then uh, if we can uh, check that uh, under the Delhi Sultan they were, uh, can we trace this uh, from uh, this that they were calling it Zillal Allah that means uh, shadow of God on earth. Now if we see that how uh, Abul Fazal articulated the theory of uh, uh, sovereignty then how he is calling that emperor as Farrah Yazdi means it was a divine 
divine concept of divine light and so the divine he is directly getting the light uh, from the almighty uh, here uh, it is very important uh, uh, that then the pet concept because he is part of uh, the the almighty and then the concept of the paternal love and the whole concept of sulakul which has this concept of paternal uh, 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 addressing as the, the sons uh, uh, or whether bande gaane darga sons particularly so that uh, is what you are uh, uh, yeah, i think you know we are mixing up two thing two three things you know here let's uh, put it more clearly you know one thing is that uh, this abul fazal is when he is uh, um, creating or you know evolving a theory of you know sovereignty or theory of state you know his emphasis is on some kind of social contract you know there is a theory of social contract in abul fazal that there is a contract between the subject and the emperor and this subject um, contract is basically that <coughs> you know the king will protect them and they have to pay them revenue to him this you know mm -hmm. that sovereignty is a remunerative you know of, of protection you know this, this, in this, view of protection in this uh, but here when we are bringing these issues of you know this uh, ray of god or part of you know that the sun because you were speaking about the patrimonial and so i patron sons no no here the um, basically in his uh, uh, efforts to legitimize akbar's you know rule it's a very great you know legitimatory you know strategy which uh, 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 abul fazal is engaged in and in this legitimatory strategy what he is doing is basically that he is uprooting akbar from the groove of islam you know you know it is it is it is islam which was you know uh, dominate dominating you know and every aspect of him legitimate it is islam which had which was a durable structure to legi legitimize these states you know but abul fazal is uprooting uh, akbar from then and this is very evident that all other chroniclers you will find that they start the history of a emperor begin with muhammad you know but here is uh, abul fazal who starts the history of akbar's family from adam you know so it's universal you know Univer this is a universal, universal concept, concept of you know it's not a religious concept of you know sovereignty it is basically universal sovereignty because he starts his history from adam himself in this so th that's why here it is also important that how after uh, issue uh, issuing of uh, mahzar that he, akbar is declared as uh, mushtahid means uh, interpreter of sharia he was placed uh, 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 imam e adil so above the sharia so the the what akbar would be decreeing his his Uh, 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 his his uh, order should prevail even over uh, sharia because of this his position no, declared no, in the matter as imam e adil and that matter has been um, um, slightly misunderstood basically what he is saying if there is a dispute is in case in, in case, case of uh, dispute, dispute between sharia and so yeah. then uh, because but he is a mushtahid so so he can so then he, he, he should uh, his uh, but then suddenly he would do all these things you know because this measure and all these things does not find place you know in any writing of inabul you know, fazal you know Bal it's there only you know, it's all, only there in mutawabat tarikh you know he only reproduces you know other historians they they don't no, i was just uh, bringing it in the context that how abul fazal was uh, displaced uh, bringing uh, uh, that islam was not important and the universal uh, theory of uh, concept of no no um, by um, the fact that he got th this authority from these uh, so many you know theologians you know Uh, that means it is he accepted their authority there itself that it is they who are declaring him you know that's you know mushtahid uh, no uh, i think um, you are raising another issue which uh, was about this uh, let's come uh, to the other uh, then uh, first so this is very important one uh, issue that no, is not no, taco and whether, whether it is both the tradition they were following both the tradition they were following Turkish but i think you know Turkish uh, tradition began to dominate started dominating dominated. with the stability of the empire mm -hmm. and uh, during the period of trouble you know mm -hmm. you know usually uh, head of the family accommodates you know junior members junior of the family junior members of so that, that is more that, you know. important so then then uh, 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 another uh, issue related to the uh, state was um, that uh, it is uh, particularly nature of the state that it is uh, argued that the mughal empire particularly the entire aligar school uh, could you uh, we can um, uh, uh, you can elaborate on that how what aligar schools argument is that the, about the that the mughal state 
it was highly centralized bureaucratic empire so which are uh, the points that uh, they argue about I think, uh, on that issue in the last uh, some decades you know there is they a very there is a controversy about the uh, the centralization of the degree of centralization of the mughal empire mughal state etc the aligarh historians you know most of them they have been say fan abi wa tharali and including you know those who are not in aligarh say even jf richards and you know tapanai yes, chaudhary they tapanai chaudhary himself also they they have been arguing that it was a highly centralized state in terms of its spread and also in terms of its depth that the state has penetrated the remotest corner of the empire and the evidence which um, especially um, professor rifan aviv gives you know of this is that you know that even uh, during the you know um, throughout the um, heyday of the mughal empire you will find that two things happening you know that after every you know interval of 3 to 4 years you know a jagirdar could be transferred you know from you know from lahore to you know um, bengal or from say from uh, kashmir to Uh, Deccan, etc. So that clearly shows that the writ of the Mughal Empire was running. You know, it That's was it could not be defied. That that with the the the, the power they had, they, they could exercise on this uh, uprooting. You know, this um, this uh, the jagirdars from one place, one jagir to another, to the remotest corner. That shows that the the order of the Mughal Empire were being obeyed by the nobility. in the even in the remotest corner you know it's not that the, the more uh, what the that that the uh, more away the jagirdar is that you know the authority of the you know state will you know peter away that's uh, they are saying it, it's not happening at so secondly both in terms of you know the creation of various systems whether it is the administrative system whether it is the mansab system whether it is the currency system you know this creation of these various systems even the you know even the sat that and how arali and, uh, they have extensively uh, they have uh, uh, measured the area uh, this so that also uh, clearly shows that in fact you know uh, the uh, widespread you know use of these systems or implementation of these systems you know that they are go governing the countryside with the help of these systems and not mm, with the help of local chieftains alone you know so therefore the mughal in fact the writ of the mughal state was uh, reaching to these these places it was a highly centralized state in that sense you know and uh, in fact uh, tapanai choudhury in his that cambridge economic history volume has said that uh, it was an insatiable uh, leviathan with unlimited appetite for resources you know the degree with which they could you know implement in impose their you know their um, authority Uh, even in terms of you know collecting revenue or mobilizing uh, particularly uh, through zapt which uh, uniform zapt right, no? so uh, therefore they these introduction systematization of these system these um, institutions uh, uh, there is a high degree of system systematization of these institutions and i think from that angle one can say that there was a considerable you know centralization of power in fact you know this in fact um, but how to what extent now the revisionist and others are arguing that actually uh, what aligarh school is saying uh, arguing uh, about uh, that how to to which extent actually uh, it was uh, centralized and bureaucratic actually uh, uh, there so are various strands within the revisionist within you know, the revisionist uh, but the focus is there there is a consensus consensus among them on one issue saying that it was not a centralized not state a centralized. on that issue they are basically all uh, agreeing you know now the basic in fact uh, argument of these uh, revisionist historians comes out very clearly in the volume edited by sanjay subramaniam and muzaffar alam the mughal state you know in that volume where in fact uh, they are saying through uh, expressing lot of things you know through one sentence you know they say that mughal state was a patchwork quilt rather than a wall to wall carpet you know the patchwork quilt means you know sadi fati fati you know rajai thi matlab jo hai it was not a wall to wall various carpet. elements put together no no i mean its authority was not, not running throughout not you know, throughout it was uh, there are areas in fact you know, where you know, their authority was questioned contested you know and therefore this is one way of saying uh, and this in fact you know uh, has been reflected in the writings you know frank paulin also Frank Pauling also has uh, uh, um, likened the Mughal state 
with some kind of what he uses called the umbrella structure that the Mughal state was a, some kind of umbrella structure whereby he says that the um, existence of the Mughal state or the disappearance of the Mughal state in fact was not of great you know uh, relevance so far as the uh, society and the economy was concerned why it was not relevant he says that between the um, the the, the um, peasants and the state there was what he calls a kind of intermediate you know a intermediate strong structure you know strata you know it is this intermediate structure you know which was in fact running and controlling the society and if the Mughals could manipulate them then they could succeed if the Mughals were not able to manipulate them then they could not succeed you know and therefore the alliance of the large number of you know these Rajput chiefs you know with the Mughals and also the incorporation of a number of you know Jamindars you know in various areas uh, with the day to day you know everyday forms of governance in at the local level in fact uh, uh, Parlin says that in fact it is these people who are basically running the state and therefore Mughal state in fact was a kind of umbrella and uh, below that you know yeah, its authority was not yeah. running you know it was just a but uh, why you are uh, forgetting uh, Chetan Singh who is uh, on uh, who his work is on 17th century Punjab and he is also um, uh, among the revisionists we can say and he is counter arguing all the three important aspects that Aligarh school uh, has uh, put forward uh, he says uh, that as far as if we take the ZAP system it was not as uniformly applicable as it is being uh, argued by the Aligarh group of historian Irfan Habib and others and the second important they say that the, it was the measurement was almost complete uniform that he also uh, taking the case of Punjab he clearly uh, points out that it was not the case it was not uniform then third important aspect he says that the, uh, on which the Aligarh school argues uh, or uh, heavily uh, saying that it was uh, how the, it was a centralized structure was the transfer of Jagi. He said that the Jagi transfer was were not as frequent as it is being uh, I think there are two, two on two counts you know he has questioned the earlier historians you know this uh, formulation of a centralized, centralized state. state and these two issues as you have rightly identified are uh, basically number one uh, in one article he said that uh, he showed the a very great longevity of the stay of some Jagirdars you know some families there you know and thereby he questioned that they were not frequently you know Transfer. transfer. So, in a subsequent, I think, rejoinder, uh, thoroughly, in fact, you know, he corrected him and saying that he has wrongly identified some of the biographies of these, you know, novels. They are not the same person who are staying there. They are two different, three, two different persons, you know. Not so, number one, that is, so therefore, uh, maybe uh, thoroughly in uh, heaven must be still, you know, uh, waiting for that reply from Chetan Singh, mm -hmm. uh, whether it will come or not. He has never rejoined you know in this debate with authority on that issue number two that issue of you know Jabt, it's not Jabt alone he is basically saying that the extent of this so called agrarian society you know which the earlier historians talk about you know it was not as extensive as they are talking about in fact uh, the, the, the existence of you know tribal systems you know outside this agrarian society was also quite considerable there and therefore you know, the, the, to say that it is the agrarian society, basically, agrarian system, you know, which is sustaining the Mughal state, you know, basically, if the, that system is not very expensive, very extensive in, the, in Punjab, then how, can, how could it sustain, you know. But I think there also, this um, various groups, you know, like I, I will give one example, you know, uh, and it's there in Chetan Singh's um, book himself, this um, Punjab, Punjab during the, he, this positing of the empire you know against a region you know an area a region that it is a uh, regional autonomy or regional formulations you know which are so vibrant and so dynamic that they don't allow the imperial system to dominate it you know so the regional assertion and later on it's there reflected in others writings also many others you know the subsequently during the 18th century that it is the regions which are um, very important and regional systems you know which are uh, operating there and this in fact uh, argument has been taken to a very great you know uh, to very uh, it has been taken to a um, high degree of you know um, say um, uh, some kind of you know eclecticism you know 
by uh, uh, my colleague, you know, Farhat Hassan in his uh, recent book, you know, State and uh, Locality in Mughal India, you know, where he totally deprivileges the Mughal state, you know, and highlights the state, uh, there, the edge of the state was in you know, a passive uh, structure and in relation to the dynamism of the locality, you know, locality which was more dynamic, you know, this, you know, and uh, through this jargon of, you know, shared sovereignty, you know, he has tried, I think uh, in what way sovereignty was shared, it has to be known how it was shared. I mean, this notions of sovereignty, state, and you know this uh, locality. In fact, uh, they cannot be understood or analyzed basically by looking at the day-to-day -day governance, etc. You know, day-to-day -day governance. Then uh, you uh, you have to identify, and uh, the I think it would have been uh, it could be um, understood by you know basically distancing himself from the centralized school and the you know complete decentralized school you know he has brought a new and this basically uh, is the result of his you know lot of you know impact of Foucault on his writings you know this Foucaultian notion of you know on uh, Paris writing, ah, Paris Paris writing Foucaultian notion of you know this uh, controlling power you know now here you will find there if uh, there are a lot of criticism of Foucault's you know writings on this issue you know power that uh, but there also there is one important issue if one looks at it you know now one can say that um, there is a controller you know there is a strategy of control but Foucault never identifies the strategist you know strategist. here also by deprivileging the state he is removing the strat that strategy is there strategy of governance but the who is the strategist you know the strategy just here is the state you know and this is totally by looking at this way it will totally in fact goes in a way against another notion of the Mughal state that it was a highly exploitative structure you know that's about the Delhi Sultan also that's a um, Marxist you, you know argue. understanding of uh, uh, the medieval state mm -hmm. that these states were, were highly exploitative you know and total surplus was taken away by them if they are highly exploitative and they are quite rapacious you know structures etc then uh, the notion of this sharing of sovereignty if they are sharing sovereignty then how they, they are oppressed you know you are taking over the entire surplus, contradiction you know? an inherent contradiction. Uh, here we can uh, also look at uh, Chetan's argument that even what Chetan is arguing, the concept of Punjab that he is taking, he is uh, the 17th century Punjab, he is uh, equating with modern Punjab, while at the time that Punjab was uh, uh, having three different subas and uh, taking three different subas as one ent entity and arguing that the transfers were within one region, one suba, that is completely erroneous. If a, pers a, pers a noble or mansadar was uh, transferred as a governor to the Suba of Delhi and uh, from Suba Multan, then he, he can't be uh, argued that he was in within, within, one, within one Suba. Similarly, that same uh, whether he when he is arguing about that uh, uh, the Fauldars were uh, developing uh, roots uh, within the within the region and uh, rebelling and local religion and uh, uh, region and that's why transfer of Jagi was almost practically ineffective. Now again here the same problem, the same Foydars, uh, if we see that the Foydar was uh, transferred from uh, Multan or Lahore Suba to Delhi Suba or from Delhi to uh, to Lahore Suba but he is taking the entire all these three Suba as one single then, entity. Logically so then so then logically uh, we cannot accept that. Uh, at least we have to accept uh, uh, to this extent Aligarh school that the transfer of Jagi uh, were comparatively were uh, religiously effectively uh, followed and uh, the, all the detailed data if we see Professor Athar Ali's detailed apparatus of the empire that uh, transfers were made within two or three yeah, years yeah. even my work on Delhi Suba shows that except that the phase when Aurangzeb shifted permanently to Deccan and he was facing the crisis that uh, it were the, the the nobles he was not getting the confident nobles he was in the Deccan and he had to manage the entire North India so uh, getting the persons of confidence that's why the tra 
uh, these transfers were not as frequent and the uh, governors were uh, um, continued for five years or seven years in some case even 15 years but that was a crisis situation and prior to even in the first till first wave no no i think even during that period in my article was there agreement delhi suba he was facing the real crisis and 15 uh, some cases he was for 15 years when noble was not so many bodars and these subedars you know they were transferred transferred frequently, frequently but he was facing little bit but it till first phase we, we do not find no, even the uh, second phase when the jart uprising was taking place at the time to deal with the jarts you know frequently he changed you know on, on this uh, subedars and fauzdars etc of mathura of uh, this area and this um, uh, agra itself you know Mathura and uh, but in Delhi Suba uh, yeah, period long, that, uh, little longer but it is yeah. interesting to find that even in the second phase he was where the rebellions were he was and even the area of this uh, so, uh, fathers of you know Ranthambore and you know Chatsu and all these Alwar etc or uh, they were frequently and, and even Chetan's issue. argument that Arazi was not complete Arazi was uh, almost uh, uh, extensively by coming to Aurangzeb's period it was uh, quite 90% uh, uh, at least uh, 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 my analysis on Delhi Zuba so uh, almost 95% of the area was uh, uh, measured Arazi means it's a measured area so it was a measured area so this this is not uh, uh, we so you are to go basically saying that you know this um, large area has, had also been brought under you know measurement that also shows that you know how the effectively these people were you know measuring the local resources etc productivity and all these things of land and thereby you know in fact you know um, basing their tax ta taxes on on the that uh, but but if we take uh, Chetan's argument on center and periphery, then definitely in the peripheral areas, uh, zamindars were uh, comparatively, uh, they had uh, um, opportunity. If we see that even the, the retainers, armed retainers that were being maintained by the zamindars in the peripheral area if, uh, were comparatively much larger. In that extent, to that extent, we can accept. I think the peripheral areas, you know, this uh, we have the knowledge of the zamindars from Ayne Akbari, and uh, the peripheral, you know, Subhas they uh, came to the Mughal Empire under the Mughal Empire later, so we don't have any information about them, you know, from that, you know. So therefore, there also we can't say that in the peripheral area. See, it one argument can uh, spring from it, and that is that. The, uh, it's not that in uh, one day the Jamidars uh, surrendered or accepted the authority of the Mughals and it continued, you know, uh, very nicely throughout, you know, it's not, you know. Because the relations between the Jamidars and the uh, Mughals were always remained tense and therefore the state was always uh, uh, renegotiating, you know, even even, even taking the case of Jars, you, uh, since you have worked ex uh, extensively on uh, taking the case of Jars, how effective Mughal control was? Mughal control was, you know, um, during the... Um, because it was the Agra Suba, Agra Delhi Suba and... Uh, no, we are talking about a, at a time when the, the entire area had become Zor Talab, you know. Zor Talab. So, uh, at that time, you know, authority was eroding, you know, that, you know. But that is the time when Mughal authority itself throughout the country was weakening, you know, later on, you know. The, so in you accept that second phase, uh, this was the crisis period. From the second phase of uh, Aurangzeb's period, uh, uh, I it think, was you know, and that... That uh, this um, basically also can be, you know, linked with, you know, what Barnier says that, you know, that uh, under Aurangzeb, you know, this uh, um, um, Muslim dimension of the, you know, th dimension of the state was being re-emphasized, you know, it was being, you know, vigorously, you know, imposed. And because of that also, you know, it's uh, reflected in the isol this uh, alienation of the Rajputs also from the uh, Mughals, you know. But uh, if you see that uh, 30, uh, uh, the percentage of Rajput, even Mirza Raja Jai Singh, Jaswan Singh, highest, uh, uh, got the highest no, officers, 7,000, 7,000. I'm talking after Jaswan Singh. Post, Jaswan rebellion and then, you know, this crisis, you know, in uh, Badur Shah's time, that crisis, you know, when Jodhpur and, you know, Amir were brought under, you know, brought in the under Khalisa. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about that phase, you know, that, that, that. So, I'm saying that the state was always negotiating, you know, it was, there was a contesting negotiation, contestation, nego negotiations were always going on, you know. And but still the authority of the Mughal emperor, you know, it's uh, um, authority of the Mughal emperor um, uh, continued even up to 1857. So uh, we can um, uh, conclude the session with, the, with saying that the, as far as the authority of the uh, central power or authority of the Mughal empire, emperors were concerned, it continued even up to um, as to late as 1857. He was accepted even in, during the rebellion, 1857 rebellion, Bahadur Shah Zafar was accepted as the monarch. 
as uh, and batch uh, of the uh, emperor of india so it was there so contesting uh, uh, authorities were there but as far as absolute uh, it was uh, in absolute terms uh, even if it uh, you uh, you will not say that it was uh, to which extent it was a centralized bureaucratic uh, empire but uh, the authority of the throughout the 17th century it was the authority of the monarch uh, was uh, and the emp empire was highly centralized bureaucratic uh, you go with aligarh school yeah it was a despotic monarchy despotic monarchy so with these words that uh, mughal empire was highly centralized bureaucratic and uh, now the new researches are emphasizing upon the revisionist school that is being that it was not as highly centralized bureaucratic as it has been presented by aligarh school with this these words thank you very much for being with us thank thanks you. thank you very much